Jerry, I think we need to get you to the hospital because you're having a heart attack. I didn't believe him. I said, people like me don't have heart attacks. Do I look like someone that would have a heart attack? And I was very wrong. SCAD can really happen to anyone and it can present in many different ways. I had a SCAD and a cardiac arrest. I had no risk factors and nothing that really indicated that this would happen. I had to retire from my teaching job, a job that I really loved at the age of 34, after just having my third son due to being diagnosed with SCAD and then going on to develop heart failure. Hello and welcome to Beat SCAD's introduction to pregnancy-related SCAD for healthcare professionals. Have you ever come across spontaneous coronary artery dissection? Because that's a bit of a mouthful, going forward we'll call it SCAD for short. SCAD is a frequently missed and misdiagnosed rare heart condition that cannot yet be predicted or prevented. A bruise or a tear develops between the layers of a coronary artery wall, which reduces or stops the flow of blood through the artery. Heart attack, cardiac arrest, or sudden cardiac death can follow. It's important to note that SCAD has nothing to do with atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is a clotting problem. SCAD is a bleeding problem. Because most SCAD patients have few or no cardiac risk factors, and because many will have normal ECGs, healthcare professionals often explore non-cardiac causes for their cardiac symptoms. Pregnant and postpartum women who have had a SCAD say they always get checked for pulmonary embolism or preeclampsia, but rarely for a cardiac problem, even when they are having clear cardiac symptoms. So, what symptoms should you be looking out for? Symptoms of SCAD are the same as for any acute coronary syndrome. Chest pain or discomfort, pain in the jaw, back or shoulders, heavy numb arms, nausea and dizziness, breathlessness, sweating. Pregnancy related SCAD patients get told they are too young and too full of hormones to be having a heart attack. They often get a diagnosis of indigestion or anxiety but 50% of all postpartum coronary events are believed to be due to SCAD. Many SCAD patients will recover very well, but some are sadly left with heart failure. The quicker a SCAD heart attack is diagnosed and managed, the more likely the patient is to recover well. Time equals muscle. In the rest of this video, you will hear from leading UK SCAD researcher, Dr. David Adlam, and from women who have had a spontaneous coronary artery dissection around the time of their pregnancies. Pregnancy associated SCAD is mostly a postpartum phenomenon. Postpartum means after the delivery of the baby. And when we look at all of the patients that we collected, the commonest time is in the first month, but there were patients in a sort of group in the first six months, in the odd case at other times. It can happen in pregnancy, mostly in the last trimester, so the last three months of pregnancy, but that's really very unusual. So those, those cases are rare. It is not common overall, so it is obviously a very rare thing to happen in pregnancy and after delivery of a baby. But if you look at heart attacks that are occurring in that context, obviously heart attacks in patients who've just delivered a baby are, are themselves uncommon. But of the heart attacks that do occur in this group, probably quite a significant proportion, maybe as many as half of them would be due to SCAD rather than other causes. If you are looking after a patient, for example, who is having typical symptoms of a heart attack in that period of time after pregnancy, it is certainly something that we should think about because one of the challenges, of course, with pregnancy associated SCAD is it's, we're not thinking about heart attacks in this population as healthcare professionals. It's not the group of people that we're used to seeing. But again, we've just got to listen carefully to what the patient's saying. And if the patient's giving a story that could be consistent with a heart attack, we need to check and uh, get them into hospital and check a troponin. The 
this paper was really focused on this aspect of SCAD that occurs in and around the time of pregnancy. That's hopefully helpful to healthcare professionals more widely, because of course these are patients that are not necessarily going to pick up the phone to a cardiologist. You know, they may be seeing an obstetrician or a health visitor, and we want people out there who are looking after patients after delivery of the baby to know about this condition and think about it. The study shows and confirms some other previous data that pregnancy-associated SCAD does seem to have a more serious presentation sometimes than SCAD outside the context of pregnancy. And this is something that we're starting to understand a little bit more about that, again, those hormones potentially have a play in terms of determining the severity of the presentation. However, despite that, a significant proportion of these patients, nearly two thirds of the patients, were still able to be managed without stents. Sometimes stents are necessary in patients who present with SCAD, who, for example, have a blocked artery or presenting with a, you know, in a situation where blood supply needs to be improved urgently to the heart. But we know from other papers that stents um, can cause issues. And we also know that SCAD heals if it's left alone. And so, if you like, what we're often trying to do with SCAD patients is to manage them without stenting. We call that managing them conservatively to allow the vessel to heal by itself. And this paper confirmed that even despite the fact that the SCAD presentations in terms of the extent of the dissections in patients with pregnancy-associated SCAD were more advanced, it was still possible to manage the majority of these patients conservatively, so without stents or bypass grafts. But the final element was looking at pregnancies in patients who have previously had SCAD. And this is, of course, a question for many of our patients who are of childbearing age is trying to understand whether having a future pregnancy, what is the risk of that? Now, I think it's important to start by saying that the risk of pregnancy is very individualized in this context. There are a lot of other factors to be thought about. How well does the heart function? Are there other issues in the arteries elsewhere in the body on the screening that we need to think about, little aneurysms, dissections elsewhere that might be in play? And of course, the tablets that patients are taking and what the impact of those tablets might be on baby's development. What the study showed, and this confirmed data that's published by our friends in the Mayo Clinic in the US who published a, a similar sized study, that the risk of recurrent SCAD is probably around 1 in 10 during the pregnancy and 12 months after delivery of the baby. So the risk of very serious things happening, like not surviving or having a very severe heart attack, leaving a lot of damage to the heart would be very, very much lower. And again, in the whole P-SCAD cohort that we were looking at, actually, the, the degrees of heart injury um, in the longer term were, were, were small, which is always, again, a reassurance. So the risk about one in 10 of having a second SCAD event during that period of time. I think the symptoms are the same as they are for SCAD as a whole and indeed for heart attacks as a whole. We know that women with heart attacks of whatever cause, that sometimes the description of symptoms can be a little bit different. And we see this in women, also sometimes in patients of different ethnic backgrounds and different cultural backgrounds, descriptions can vary. But broadly speaking, there isn't a difference in the types of symptoms that people describe who are having pregnancy associated SCAD or SCAD in general compared to another type of heart attack. But they can be variable. There's often chest pain. Obviously, it's often central, sometimes described as crushing, might go up into the jaw or the arm even into the back sometimes, but there's lots of variations around that. And I think sometimes it's the other aspects that patients think about. So people will often say to me that they knew something was wrong <laughs> or they just felt ill. And sometimes those things can be almost bigger clues than the specific type of chest pain or how it, how it exactly feels to an individual. Just that feeling that there's definitely something here that needs to be looked into. And I think the main challenge in pregnancy associated SCAD is, of course, after delivery of a baby, there are many changes happening to the body at that time. And to some extent, there's a sort of relearning of your body process after delivering a baby, trying to work out what's a normal feeling, what's not a normal feeling. Uh, and that can make it difficult for people. But I think 
the, the, the symptoms are not different. If you get the symptoms and, you know, the things that you recognize as being associated with the heart attack, and if you feel that something is definitely wrong, there's no harm in getting that checked out, making sure everything's okay and that you're safe. We tend to associate heart attacks with the at-risk groups that we're familiar with for the common type of heart disease, atherosclerotic or ischemic heart disease, we call it. So we're looking for more predominantly men with those risk factors, smoking, blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and so on. And of course, traditionally, younger women or women around the age and time of childbirth would be in very, very low risk group for classical coronary artery disease but of course, SCAD is a different disease. So I think the most important thing, and again, one of the things that we, we want to put out there with the paper is if you've not heard of it, you're not going to think of it. And if you're not going to think about it, you're not going to be able to give the right advice in that uncommon. Remember, this is not a common condition. It's rare. But in that uncommon scenario, when maybe they'll come across somebody who uh, could be having pregnancy associated SCAD. I don't know entirely what the explanation for this is, but I think it's likely to lie in the changes that are occurring in female sex hormones, predominantly around the time of delivery and afterwards. We know that after delivery of a baby, there are very profound changes in female sex hormones, which ultimately culminate in the return of the normal menstrual cycle in these patients. We've known for some time, of course, that there's probably some role for female sex hormones in the underlying causes of SCAD, which we call the pathophysiology. We don't know entirely how those connections work at the moment. But I think the fact that SCAD occurs at this time after delivery of a baby strongly suggests that there's a hormonal element to the risk of this happening. We've still got some way to go to understand the mechanism that makes that happen, but that's likely to be the explanation. It's important to recognize that patients are individuals and their particular situations after a SCAD can be quite variable. Things like the amount of injury to the heart, how well the heart is pumping, the findings on the other scans elsewhere in the body, looking for maybe aneurysms or dissections if they're present elsewhere in the body, that can be important. And again, as part of that, the medications that patients take, of course, some medications can be potentially damaging to a developing baby. It's important that somebody who's contemplating pregnancy goes to the right place to make sure that all of the different elements are thought about to make sure that they're safe to go ahead with the pregnancy, or at least they understand what the risks are and can weigh up whether or not they want to go ahead with a pregnancy in that context, because it's not going to be risk-free. You can never say that it's going to be free of risk. I was in my second trimester when I started to feel ill, was getting migraines and was really, really exhausted. Every time I spoke to my midwife, I was made to feel like I was a nuisance. I was made to feel quite silly. So I went to see my GP. Thankfully, he listened to me and he signed me off work at um, 32 weeks. Within those eight weeks till when my son was born, again, still not feeling right. I was due to have a caesarean section with my third son. And when I was booked in to have it, uh, my heart rate was really, really high. And there was talk of possibly not doing the caesarean section, but thankfully they were able to stabilise me and I had on. I was sitting in the living room, just relaxing, breastfeeding him. And all of a sudden I started to get the pain in my ear and in my jaw. I felt quite nauseous. I had a funny feeling when I was breathing. My arms felt quite heavy. I kind of thought that maybe I've got a wee bit of a like food poisoning. And the GP told me I was having panic attacks. A couple of days later, we went out for a family walk, just really, really leisurely. And the symptoms started again, quite hard to breathe. There's just something not quite right. It's not a panic attack. I know it's not a panic attack. 
So I went to um, the maternity ward and the doctor that I saw there, she was just, she had a gut instinct that there just was something untoward, but she couldn't put her finger on it. So she said, I'm going to admit you for the night. I was very, very glad they did because during the night I had another episode. Obviously after they'd done ECGs, done chest x-rays and they'd taken bloods, they then had realised that my troponin levels were extremely high. So they transferred me over to the cardiac ward with my, I had my 11 day old, 12 day old baby with me. A lovely young doctor came in and I said that he needed to put me on clopidogrel, which is a blood thinner, and that I was going to have to stop breastfeeding. So they got me some bottles from the maternity ward and I was breastfeeding, looking down at him, and then the symptoms came back again. But this time they were, I can't say it was pain as such. There was never any real pain. It was just aches. So press the buzzer, the nurse came in, put me on an ECG and then she literally pressed the lights, the blue, the alarm and every doctor that was on the ward came rushing in. That was when they told me I was having huge heart attacks. And that was the first time that I really realised the extent of it. I was rushed off for an angiogram. They kept continually asking me, did I take drugs? You know, how much I drank, how much I smoked. And I was I was just like, I've, I've just had a baby. You know, I haven't had anything to drink. The coronary arteries had split, but they didn't understand why this had happened. There happened to be a medic there who had read about SCAD. And he said, look, I think I have an idea of what this is. They decided that bypass surgery was the option. Just as they were about to operate, the LAD, which is also known as the Widowmaker, dissected right in front of them. I had bypass surgery with six grafts and yeah, they very nearly lost me. Went off to ICU afterwards and they didn't think that I was going to make it through the night because my heart had failed so much. It was after about eight weeks that they realised that I was not um, improving as much as they thought that I should have done by this stage and they realised that I was actually in heart failure. So there is a huge chunk on the left ventricle, the bottom of the left ventricle, that the muscle has died. So I have a huge chunk of the bottom of my heart that actually doesn't beat anymore. Before being diagnosed with SCAD, I was a teacher. It was my dream career. I had just recently been qualified and I had lots of plans for the future. However, having been diagnosed with heart failure, it just totally changed my life. Um, I would not be able to work again, never mind teach. So at the age of 35, after my maternity leave had um, finished, I was medically retired. And I do often wonder if somebody had listened to me, listened to the fact that I just didn't feel right. You know, could my sort of life have not been as impacted as badly as it is now. My pregnancy was my first pregnancy. I had no problems at all. I think I was sick twice in the whole pregnancy. Even coming to the birth, in the words of my mother, who was a midwife for 40 years, it was textbook. At the time, I was 36 years old um, and had no concerns at all with regards to my health. On the day of my SCAD, I was at home with my 17-week-old daughter. I felt tired, but then I was a new mum. I was breastfeeding, but it was a, a generally a, a nice, easy day. That evening was my first opportunity to go out with my friends, and so I'd arranged to, to go out for a dinner. On that day, I can recall... Um, my husband dropping me off about half past five to go in for dinner and I have no further recollection after that point. From here I'm relying on the memories of my kind of two friends and kind of what they told me. They said we had dinner, we had a couple of glasses of wine and absolutely everything was fine. There was no issues, they had no concerns and we were just stood having a conversation and one of them says one minute I was there and the next minute I was down on the ground and I kind of uh, completely like I collapsed or fainted. She didn't think I was breathing. And so they immediately called an ambulance. And by the time they kind of got to me, they realised that I wasn't breathing and they had to uh, revive me to, to kind of bring me back using CPR. 
I very, very quickly then was transported to our local hospital. They realised that I needed um, to be put into an induced coma because they felt that that was the best option for me. And until they could really work out what was wrong, they were concerned that maybe it was drug related. And they asked my friends and family, you know, did I take drugs? The next time I can really remember is probably three or four days later as I came out from my induced coma. By that point, the cardiologist had diagnosed it as being a SCAD. But what he said was, when they'd actually done all all the kind of look, that my heart looked like it had recovered and it was back to where it should have been. It just decided it was going to stop. They'd managed to get it restarted and there was actually no real damage. And so it was just going to be a matter of kind of recuperating and recovering. I was in the hospital for two weeks. That was quite difficult because I had a young baby, but the hospital staff there were amazing and and really kind of supported me to make sure she could be with me every day. I had a subcutaneous ICD fitted following my PSCAD. Because mine was so quick and there was no onset of symptoms, it seemed to me like a good option. And so just before the second week, I had that fitted and the next day um, I was ready and, and they could send me home. I was tired, even more tired with a baby. I needed a lot of support from family and friends. And I think one of the main things that's difficult is actually when you've had no warning and nothing's there, suddenly you think, what if it happens again? And even though you've got this device that's there, there is a fear. And I had a fear for many weeks and months of being on my own with the responsibility of a baby. It's important that you're aware of it and check on some of those symptoms and don't always assume that symptoms like pain in the arms or the chest or something, are automatically going to be down to breastfeeding or that tiredness is automatically down to having a baby. So before my SCAD, I was perfectly fit and healthy. I've always been an active person. I worked in the city. I thrived in working under pressure. I have no family history of cardiac problems. The birth of my son was a normal delivery. Everything was fine. The day of my scad, it all started fine. My family were visiting and I was making tea. I had a sudden pain in my chest, more of a discomfort pain rather than a sharp pain. First, I thought it was digestive. I was eating something too quickly. But over the course of several hours, it started to build and also the pain in my back and my arms. And I started vomiting. I started to not be able to breathe. It was like a crushing pain on my chest. And so I called 111. They said I need to take some aspirin. They were going to send an ambulance. It sounds like I'm having a heart attack. Several hours later, the paramedics arrived. They did an ECG and took my blood pressure. And they said it was all normal, but I was in severe distress. And they knew that there was something up. The paramedic said, we do need to take you to the hospital. We'll get you a blood test. It's the only way we can rule out a heart attack because we might have missed the event. I still was in denial at this point that this was a heart attack. Um, Particularly as my husband had had said previously, Jerry, with my work, if you were having these symptoms, we would hand you to the paramedics. He's a firefighter. I told him not to be stupid. Why would I be having a heart attack? We got to the hospital in A&E and... They said, I doubt it's a heart attack. You don't look like someone that's going to have a heart attack. Luckily, they did do a blood test, x-rays, things like that, chest x-rays. And several hours later, there was a rush into the trolley area that I was on. And I was whisked down the hospital and into the resuscitation ward. So at first, they thought it was myocarditis because I was slim, I was fit, I was healthy. They then subsequently asked if I had taken heroin or cocaine. And I said, no, never had done in my life and certainly not being a mother. They couldn't work out why this has happened. I arrived at uh, Basildon to have my angiogram done. And Dr. Keeble was a cardiologist. He said, I doubt your arteries are clogged. And if I put this wire inside your heart, I could do irreparable damage. So we'll get you an MRI. Unfortunately, the MRI didn't work. Uh, My heart was in too much trauma and it didn't slow down enough. So we had to do the angiogram. But he heavily sedated me so I didn't move and he could be precise in what he was doing. When I woke up, he did say that um, it was SCAD. It was a tear in my circumflex artery. And he would refer me to Dr. Al Husseini, his colleague, who's a specialist in London. 
it was going to be a 12 month waiting list to see her on the NHS. And thankfully, I had private medical insurance through my employer. And therefore, I saw her privately within a week. And if it wasn't for that, I would not have made the recovery, particularly when I was discharged, because I would never have known to do the things that she informed me to do in order to recover. She did also explain it'll take approximately a year or so to physically recover, but maybe up to two years to emotionally recover. And she is absolutely right. My physical recovery is almost complete. I'm still going with my emotional recovery because my life came to a crashing stop. And I feel personally, if it wasn't for seeing her and her understanding of SCAD, I wouldn't be where I am today in terms of, of my recovery. The key thing for healthcare professionals is to listen to the story, to listen to what the patient is saying. I think it's listening to mothers or listening to people and just keeping in the back of your mind that it could be something else. Listen to your patients. They know their own bodies. They know what doesn't feel right for them. That is just probably the most powerful thing. Just listen and act upon it. Your response can make a huge difference to a person's life. Often patients will say that they felt something was wrong We tended to see patients after the fact, but often the stories that they give are of typical symptoms that we are used to hearing in terms of heart disease and and heart attacks. Treat the person, not the pathways of the symptoms, because we don't express them. And always remember that for a patient to pop to hospital and get a troponin checked, if you're worried about this as a possible diagnosis, it's a very sensitive blood test. If it's normal, you know, there's a very quick answer to the question that you can you can get for patients. Don't be afraid to do those extra tests just to check their troponin levels to an ECG. Just not to assume as well that it may be drug related or, or kind of anything to do with that, because there are other reasons why people who are young may have a cardiac incident. Particularly for the P scad, being detached from a baby for a week is horrendously difficult, aside from what you're going through in your own recovery. So it's really important to think about that aspect of motherhood and not just someone who's had a heart attack and is dealing with a coronary problem. I never knew anybody like me had a heart attack. That's why I didn't believe or trust in anything. So I think more needs to be done in helping people understand that actually it does occur. We hope you have found this film a useful summary of what spontaneous coronary artery dissection is, how it can impact pregnancy, and what healthcare professionals need to be aware of. And having heard some very different patient stories, you will also now be aware that SCAD can present in many ways. Further resources to read and watch will be shared in the comments section. But perhaps the most important takeaway from this short film is to be ready to have a raised index of suspicion when presented with a pregnant or postpartum patient with cardiac symptoms, particularly if they have few or no cardiac risk factors. If you have any doubts at all, please insist on a troponin blood test to rule out a cardiac explanation for your patient's symptoms. Doing this simple blood test might just save a heart and possibly even a life.